In the review podcast, we discussed a variety of simple movements, such as flexion, extension, abduction, and adduction. These simple movements combine to form much more complex movements, from playing a Mozart piano concerto to performing a gymnastic floor exercise to whatever this guy's doing. Now, the one thing that all of these abstract movements have in common is that they are generated by a series of complex neural signals that pass from the brain and through to the spinal cord. In this first lesson, we focus our attention on the protection provided to that spinal cord in the form of the vertebral column. Good day, and welcome to the first of many video lecture podcasts for the Anatomy 407 course. I'm Dr. Stuart Engels. Our first session focuses on the vertebral column, which is commonly referred to as the backbone. Bit of a misnomer, as we will see, since the column is made up of multiple bones. The topic is broken down into four separate sessions. We'll look at the general characteristics of the vertebral column in the first session. We'll then spend the second session looking at the characteristics of different types of vertebrae. In the third session, we'll put the pieces together and look at the joints and movements permitted by the vertebral column. And we'll finish things off by looking at a variety of different injuries that can occur to the vertebral column in the fourth session. In this first session, we'll begin with a general description of the vertebral column, looking at the vertebrae number and the general shape of the column. We'll then describe the morphological features of a typical vertebrae. Finally, we'll look a little bit at the growth of the vertebrae from cartilage to bone tissue. This is known as ossification. Let's start by taking a look at the vertebral column as a whole. This first slide gives an overview of the vertebral column. The vertebral column serves as the axis or rotational element of the trunk and acts as a support pillar to the thoracic and abdominal cavities. There are 33 individual vertebrae. The inferior nine vertebrae become fused early in life, forming a single unified structure. Even with this fusion, however, we can still distinguish the individual vertebrae that contributed to this fusion. The superior 24 exist as separate bones throughout the lifespan, separated by fibrocartilaginous discs. Each disc provides a small amount of movement between each vertebrae that, when combined with the movements at all the other intervertebral joints, generate dynamic movements in the spine. The limited motion permitted between each individual segment serves to protect the spinal cord found posteriorly in the vertebral canal from becoming impinged and damaged. So we can think of the vertebral column as being both highly mobile and highly protective of the spinal cord. As we shall soon see, most vertebrae have a similar architecture and the same common structures. That being said, there are also some very distinct differences. This becomes obvious as you move down the column, as the vertebrae become increasingly larger until we get to the fused vertebrae. This makes architectural sense. You want your base of support to be larger and stronger to support the weight of the segments above it. We do, however, see a reversal in the lower fused vertebrae, which become increasingly smaller. This is due to the even distribution of load to the lower limbs. The fused vertebrae can be thought of as the keystone to an archway. They accept the load from the superior vertebrae and transfer it bilaterally into the lower limbs. So we see subtle differences between one vertebrae and the next, but generally there's very little difference between adjacent vertebrae. There are four distinct boundaries, however, where we observe a more dramatic shift in vertebral morphology. This allows us to categorize vertebrae into one of five distinct regions. The seven cervical vertebrae make up the neck. The 12 thoracic vertebrae make up the upper back. The five lumbar vertebrae make up the lower back. And the five sacral and four coccygeal vertebrae make up the pelvis. This allows us to identify each vertebrae according to region and rank order. The sixth vertebrae in the cervical region, for example, is the sixth cervical vertebrae, or simply C6. The tenth vertebrae in the thoracic region is T10. The third vertebrae in the lumbar region is L3. You get the idea. Despite the fact that we have all of this variability between individual vertebrae, there are common structural elements that can be identified in almost every vertebrae, although they vary greatly in morphology. This allows us to first identify these structures in a so-called typical vertebrae before discussing how these structures differ from one region to another. 
First off, almost all vertebrae can be divided into an anterior body and posterior arch. Vertebral bodies form the principal support for the vertebral column, with successive bodies stacking to form a column, each body accepting the combined weight of the superior body segments in an upright position. It's generally cylindrical but shows characteristic shape differences from one region to another. There's also a difference in the height of the vertebrae from anterior to posterior, which accounts for normal spinal curvatures that we will discuss. The body is composed of an outer shell of dense compact bone for support with cancellous or spongy bone forming the inner core and decreasing the overall weight of the bone. This lattice work, known as trabeculae, is oriented in both vertical and horizontal directions to provide multidimensional support. This orientation is of significance in instances of bone mineral loss, as is seen with osteoporosis. As the disease progresses, there is a selective loss in horizontal trabeculae, resulting in collapse of the inner core and a characteristic biconcave shape to the vertebrae. Radiographically, this results in a visible vertical striation pattern due to the selective sparing of the vertical trabeculae. The central collapse means that more and more weight is supported by the peripheral compact bone collar over time. This gradually results in bowing of the collar and the formation of osteophytes, more commonly known as bone spurs. Posteriorly projecting osteophytes are particularly troublesome as they may compress neural structures in this region. The arch is primarily responsible for posterior protection of the spinal cord. The base of the arch is anchored to the vertebral body through bilateral pedicles, a Latin term meaning little feet. The pedicles have biconcave superior and inferior surfaces, allowing them to form rounded foramen or openings when stacked together. The bridge of the arch is formed by the lamina, broad angled plates of bone that stack together like plate armor to protect the spinal cord from blunt force trauma. Any posterior force directed towards the arch is dissipated bilaterally through the lamina and pedicles and into the vertebral body. The paired lamina fuse centrally at the apex of the arch to form the spinous process, which serves as a focal point for muscle attachment. This completes the arch, forming a central passage known as the vertebral foramen. Projecting posterolaterally from the interface between the pedicles and lamina are the transverse processes, which again serve as sites for muscle attachment. Finally, we can observe projections known as superior and inferior articulating processes. These processes contain articulating surfaces lined with hyaline cartilage, known as facets, which form joints between successive vertebrae. The pillar of bone that lies in between the articulating processes is known as the pars interarticularis. During embryological development, bone initially forms as cartilaginous models that later harden through a process known as ossification, resulting in mature bone. Vertebrae are no different. Vertebral ossification starts around eight weeks of age at three separate initial or primary ossification centers. One center, known as the centrum, is found in the central core of the vertebral body. The other two primary ossification centers form bilaterally in each lamina. As they grow, the three ossification centers ultimately fuse, completing the ossification of each vertebrae. Posterior fusion of the lamina occurs during the first year of life. Fusion of the arch with the body does not occur until the third year of life. The fusion point is known as the neurocentral joint. Don't let that term fool you, though. By the time a child turns four, the body and arch are fully fused, forming a complete vertebrae with no joint space. This pattern of vertebral development is of clinical significance in instances of incomplete development of the cartilaginous model, particularly in the vertebral arch. In these instances, there is incomplete bilateral fusion of the lamina following ossification and therefore an incomplete vertebral arch. This condition is known as spina bifida. Mild cases of spina bifida are relatively common and may affect up to 20% of the general population. This is known as spina bifida occulta, or hidden bifurcation. As the name implies, the condition is generally asymptomatic, although it may result in a predisposition to back injuries and pain later in life. It's commonly associated with skin deformities, typically a dimple above the site of malformation or a tuft of hair.
In more extreme cases of spina bifida, known as spina bifida cystica, pressure differences may force contents within the vertebral foramen to protrude through the open space. In one subtype, spina bifida meningocele, the protective coverings of the spinal cord protrude through this opening. In spina bifida myelomeningocele, portions of the spinal cord and spinal nerves also protrude. This condition is almost always associated with significant amounts of neural deficits. In addition to the primary ossification centers, there are also five secondary ossification centers that appear later along the superior and inferior margins of the compact bone collar of the vertebral bodies and at the tips of the spinous and transverse processes. The annular ossification centers are responsible for the growth and height of the vertebral column, while the other centers contribute to growth of these processes in response to muscular pull. Also note the distinct line denoting incomplete fusion of the neurocentral joint, suggesting the depiction of a relatively immature vertebrae. We're going to take a break at this point of the lesson. In the second session, we'll be looking at the regional differences between the different vertebrae. Until that point, this has been Dr. Stuart Ingalls. Enjoy your break.